My name is Miss Del Savio, and I am an AP Psychology teacher at Waltman High School in Bethesda, Maryland. And I'm really happy to be here with you today to review session two. And session two is basically unit two, which if you remember is all about the brain and the fun stuff about neuroscience. So let's start off with a little bit of a warm up that Dr. Swope left you with in session one. And that warm up was the FRQ he presented. It was about Cora, who is a video game designer who believes that games that use re virtual reality headsets will be perceived by students as more challenging. And so she proposes an experimental study to examine the belief. And he asked you to go through these four bullet points and answer them. So if you were able to do that, let's move on and take a look at what some sample answers were. And if you weren't able to do that, you could pause the video here, try them yourself, and then we'll move on. Okay, so this is just a sample response. And the first uh, bullet point was about a control group. And if you recall, a control group is the group that is not exposed to the independent variable. And note how I, I reference that in my response. I actually give a definition of what a control group is. And then I identify that control group in the scenario that was presented to us as the students who do not use the virtual reality headsets. The second term was the term operational definition. And again, in this case, you can see I gave a definition of what an operational definition is. In this case, it has to be valid, meaning it has to be an accurate, a quantifiable, meaning something that I could be measuring with numbers uh, of the variables in the study. So in this case, we decided that a valid or a quantifiable way to define challenge would be some kind of a ranking that the students give on a scale of one to five, with one being the least challenging and five being the most challenging. Any answer you gave that had a numerical response uh, would be valid and scorable. The third term was about a double blind procedure. And if you recall in an experiment, we have single blind procedures where we don't allow the uh, participants to know if they're in the controller or the experimental group. But in a double blind procedure, the researcher conducting the study also does not know who is in the control or experimental group. And it takes away some of that bias that can occur. So I've defined what a double blind procedure is. In this situation, I say it would be impossible not to notice who is wearing a headset. So the researcher would likely not be blind to the conditions. A type 1 error is also known as a false positive. And I write that very succinctly here in my response. And I go through an example in this case. It's when a researcher here thinks that there is a statistically significant difference between the results that they obtain from the control group and from the experimental group. But they're actually incorrect about that. So I say in this case, remember, we always have to go back to the prompt. In this case, Cora might think that the study shows that students wearing the VR headsets perceive the game as being more challenging, but upon review, it looks like there really uh, aren't any significant differences. In other words, the partic all participants found the games just as challenging. Okay, so there is our FRQ from session one. In this session, what are we going to learn? Well, a whole bunch, a lot, uh, and I've listed it here, and I'm not going to go through it. But as you can imagine, we do want to go over the structure of the nervous system. Um, we're going to include in that, we're going to start at the top of the brain with the cerebral cortex, move down to our limbic, then to our brainstem, and then get into that little, the nitty gritty with the uh, neurons themselves and how they transmit nerve impulses. We'll also look at the divided brain, the two different hemispheres of the brain, and the concepts of plasticity and neurogenesis, and a very, very brief review of the endocrine system, and, and look at how we study the brain. Okay, let's start with the nervous system. And on each, for each section that I go through, you're going to see a slide like this. And again, I'm not going to read these slides, but if you want to go back later and you can review this type of an intro slide to see if this is the section you want to go over. But we are going to be looking at the central nervous system, including the, and the peripheral nervous system, including the branches of the somatic and the autonomic. Okay, so just to remind you, our body has two communication systems. We have that central nervous system, which moves really quickly, our brain, our spinal cord, neurons, neurotransmitters. But then we also have our endocrine system, which works alongside the nervous system, moves a lot more slowly. It's composed of glands and hormones that get secreted into the bloodstream. So let's start with that nervous system. And if you really think about the nervous system, there's a hierarchy. You've probably seen it in all of your textbooks. But if you want to pause here and try to put all the, the boxes I have here into a hierarchy, into their appropriate order, you should try to do that before we start. And then you can kind of see where you are in terms of your understanding. So pause the video if that seems appropriate and do it. <laughs> 
Otherwise, we're going to move on and talk about the nervous system, and we're dividing it into two branches, our central nervous system, our brain and our spinal cord, and everything not in it is our peripheral nervous system, as you can see here in the diagram. Now, our nervous system, if we look at that central nervous system, has our brain, and our brain serves as our body's command central. Okay, so it, it directs all the activities that are going on. And the spinal cord, of course, is coming off the brain and it transmits all those nerve impulses that are coming from the brain or going to the brain to and from. But it also handles a really important thing called swift reflexes, that kind of thing where you touch your hand to a hot stove and then you remove it really quickly before you even process it. If I move to my peripheral nervous system, there are two branches. We have our somatic and our autonomic. So our somatic nervous system, soma is body. So we talk about soma, it's body, right? So it's body movement, body sensory experiences. So somatic nervous system, it's controlling our voluntary uh, skeletal muscles, but it also carries messages from our sense organs to the brain. So our skin, of course, you touch something, if it's warm or cold or painful, or they feel pressure, it's going to move through the somatic nervous system. Our autonomic nervous system is pretty much involuntary. So of course, it's easy to remember, right? Autonomic, automatic, involuntary. And it regulates functions that we don't even think about, you know, our digestion, our immune response, uh, heart rate. Our somatic nervous system sends information, like I said, from our sensory organs um, to the brain. And it does so through pathways, very special neurons called sensory neurons. They're also known as afferent neurons. So we talk about those sensory or afferent pathways. We're simply saying it's information that's being sent to the brain. The motor or the efferent neurons are information that's being uh, sent from the brain to your skeletal muscles. So you want to move an arm, move a leg, move a toe. Okay. So we have sensory afferent pathways moving towards the brain and motor efferent pathways moving away from the brain. As I said, our autonomic nervous system is largely involuntary. It's the regulation of our functions that we don't control. And we have two branches. We have the sympathetic nervous system, which is arousing. It, it prepares your body to deal with any kind of emergency or any kind of activity, including things like digesting food. But it also could be an emergency response like fleeing. And then you have your parasympathetic nervous system, which brings your body back to a balanced state that we know as homeostasis. So there's our sympathetic, preparing our body for maybe that fight or flight response. And there are some examples of what happens when the sympathetic nervous system is activated. So our pupils dilate, they get bigger to let more light in, which makes sense. If you're encountering an emergency, you want more information coming into that brain. Your heart rate increases. It kind of gives you that signal when your heart rate increases, I need to pay attention. Your digestion slows down. No reason to digest your food. You have an emergency event. And your immune system or your immune response is suppressed, meaning it's lowered. And again, why even bother with an immune response when I have an emergency in front of me? Our parasympathetic returns that body to homeostatic balance. So all the opposite things occur. Your pupils constrict, your heart rate slows, your digestion will resume, and your immune response is restored. And I really want to focus on that immune response because if think about it. Every time you're stressed out, your immune response is suppressed. So that's why you all get sick around November or December because you've been stressed out at school and, and your body's sympathetic nervous system's been activated, which means your, immunes, uh, your immune response is suppressed. Okay. And then you have your winter break and then you have nice like time to return to homeostasis. Okay, so just to review, this is what the hierarchy of our nervous system looks like. And these are all the boxes that I had on that first page. So if we were to take a look again, we have our brain and our spinal cord that make up our central nervous system. That peripheral nervous system has two branches, the autonomic and the somatic. Our somatic sends information to the brain, but it also receives information through different types of neurons. And our autonomic nervous system prepares our body for fight or flight, but also returns our body to homeostasis. A couple of tips before we do some practice questions. I like to remember that the acronym SAME, sensory neurons are the same things as afferent neurons and motor neurons are the same things as efferent. Uh, 
So if you get those confused, you'll see that there. Sympathetic, I just think of it as that it's a part of our nervous system that knows what we're going through. It's sympathetic to what you're going through. So it's responding to it. But our parasympathetic is like a parachute, right? It brings you right back down to the ground, brings your body back down to homeostasis. So let's do some practice here. We're going to start with this first multiple choice question about Nellie. And again, I would encourage you to read this pause and then we'll go over the response. So I'll give you a chance to do that now. Okay, so Nellie bit into that spicy pepper and the messages that we're, was carrying that sense of pain from the pepper. That's what we're feeling when we feel spicy. It's really actually pain. It's transmitted to the central nervous system through our peripheral. It's not part of the brain. It's not part of the spinal cord. It's part of our peripheral. Now, very specifically, it's part of our somatic nervous system, those sensory neurons. But you don't see that in a question in the responses, the response choices. So the best response really here is the peripheral nervous system. Again, second question, I read it and pause and we'll come back. Okay, so in this case, we have the ability to blink, digest food and breathe. All those things are automatic. So that really should point you to the answer, which is the autonomic nervous system. And the third question is about swift reflexes. So if you talk about swift reflexes, one might be that you're jumping out of a hot shower and it's facilitated, it's helped by interneurons. We haven't talked about those yet, but these interneurons that are located where? And if you recall, when we were talking about the spinal cord, it handles those swift reflexes. And we haven't talked about interneurons, but those are located in the spinal cord. Okay, and we're gonna move on to the brain. And like I said, this is a new section here. So we're gonna talk about the four lobes of the brain, the two hemispheres, the limbic system, and the brain stem. So here's our brain. We have our cerebral cortex here, the four lobes of the brain that you should be really comfortable with and know where they are. We have our frontal lobe. We have our parietal lobe at the top of our head. And if you forget that, think of party hat, which goes on the top of your head, parietal lobe, party hat might help you. Our occipital lobe, which is in the, the back, which is, if you ever hear that your parents have eyes on the back of their head, well, that's kind of, that's sort of true because the occipital lobe, which manages visual information is on the back of your head. And then we have our temporal lobe, which is on the side. Um, and as you remember, all the lobes have both a left and a right lobe, right? Because we have two hemispheres of our brain, frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal. We'll go through the cerebellum in just a minute, but there are some primary functions that occur or that happen in each of those lobes. For our frontal lobe, one of the primary motor functions is there, which is movement. So directing movement, initiating movement. I want to move my hand. I want to pick up my cup of coffee. Up oh, came from my frontal lobe. My parietal lobe is my somatosensory cortex. Now remember, soma means body. So it's our body sensory or senses. Okay, so everything's being processed there from a sensory standpoint in terms of touch. This is a, a body, a touch standpoint. So I touch something, okay, you're gonna, it's gonna be processed in my parietal lobe. So technically, if we were to do open brain surgery and open it up and, and uh, wake you up and then touch a piece of your parietal lobe, tickle a piece of it, you might feel something in your right knee, depending upon what we, where we touched in your parietal lobe. Then we have our occipital lobe, which is our primary uh, visual cortex. And then we have our temporal lobe, which is our primary auditory cortex. So temporal is on the side of your head. I guess it's, you can see here with the headphones, that's auditory. So these are just some parts of the cerebral cortex are, are dedicated to movement and sensory functions. But then there's a whole bunch of regions of those cortices that aren't dedicated to movement or sensory functions. And those areas are called association areas. So technically, they are all the regions. And it's a large part of the, the largest part of the real estate of our brain is dedicated to these association areas, which are higher order thinking and language areas. So we look at our frontal lobe, we have um, an association area that helps us to plan and make judgment and impulse control. It also handles our Broca's area, if you recall, that is our language production center. Now, we also have told you many times, I'm sure your teacher has said that your frontal lobe as a teenager is not fully developed, meaning that you're still working on that impulse control and your planning and your judgment. It'll just get better as you get older. Okay. 
our parietal lobe integrates a lot of sensory information. All the things that are coming into our brain get integrated in a uh, association area in the parietal lobe. And in our temporal lobe, we do form memories there. That's a kind of a higher order process, but there's also the idea that we might produce language in our frontal lobe in the Broca's area, but we comprehend it in the Wernicke's area, which is in our temporal lobe. So we don't really do much with the uh, association areas in the occipital lobe. There are some there, but we're not gonna review those today. Okay, this is a nice little graphic that I like. Um, that's a good overview of the lobes and the functions of the brain. Just reminding you that each of the lobes has a primary motor or sensory function, but then it has a lot of association areas, all those higher order thinking areas. So our brain, as I mentioned, is divided into two hemispheres and it's divided by a bundle of nerve fibers called the corpus callosum. And you can see it right here. It actually looks like a C. How convenient is that, right? The corpus callosum. And it is a bundle of nerve fibers that uh, takes our two hemispheres. And of course, in, in our neurotypical brains, our, our hemispheres are connected through this corpus callosum. So we don't even notice that we have a left hemisphere or a right hemisphere. If we were though to take a look and we have been able to through some studies that I'll review, we've been able to see that there are some special functions that go on in each hemisphere of the brain. And we are not necessarily aware that that's what's happening uh, through some of the split brain studies that we'll talk about. Um, we know that the left side of our brain controls the right side of our body. So when I wanna move my right hand, it's coming from my left motor cortex, right? In my frontal lobe, and it's telling my right hand to move. And of course, the opposite is true. From the right hemisphere, it helps to move my left side, but it's sending and receiving all messages. So if I, if I touch something with my left hand, it's being processed in my right parietal lobe, right? Somatosensory cortex in my parietal lobe. So my left brain, I think of left, logic, language, math, ideas, analysis, a lot of L's in my left, right? Language, logic, language is the big one. In my right, there's a lot of other functions, more of the creativity side, the abstract thought side, our, our feelings, um, imagination, uh, interpreting emotions. So we have left language, logic, right, creativity, kind of the emotional ab abstract thought processes. So again, I wanna make sure that we make this clear. <laughs> While each hemisphere may specialize in functions, there's really actually no evidence that you could be left or right brain. And again, in our neurotypical brains, we, are, we share information from the left and the right hemisphere, which really then begs the question, how do we even know that there's special functions in the left and right hemisphere? And those are through some of the important studies that were done by researchers. So we've talked about the two language areas, the Broca's area and the Wernicke's area. And Paul Broca uh, studied people in the early or the mid 1800s who had aphasia. If you recall, aphasia is somebody without speech or have a, has some kind of a deficit in speech. A meaning the pronoun, uh, pro, sorry, pronoun. <laughs> the prefix A meaning without and aphasia meaning speech, so without speech. So Paul Broca um, actually dissected the brains of people who had aphasia um, after they died. And he found that there was a portion in their left frontal lobe that was damaged. These were people who could not produce coherent speech. And it was so named the Broca's area. And that's the part of the left, the left, left hemisphere, left language, the left frontal lobe right, for speech. Now, Carl Wernicke further broke his research because he also studied people who had aphasia, but the, he also noted that there were people who had difficulty with comprehending language. And he found that Wernicke's area in the left, left language, temporal lobe. So that was some of the first studies that were done on left and right hemisphere. And they were done basically to find out that left hemisphere was damaged in people with aphasia. In the 1920s, there was a Russian physiologist who actually found what connected those two areas. And it was the corpus callosum. So he actually identified that bundle of nerve fibers in the brain that connected the two hemispheres. Now, more recent or contemporary studies were done by Roger Sperry and Mike Zaniga, and they studied, um, first of all, Sperry actually studied animals. He actually split the brains of animals. He took that corpus callosum and he lesioned or destroyed it, and he was able to study what functions were occurring in each part of the brain. And Mike Zaniga then studied people, he worked with Sperry, but he studied people 
who had to have their corpus callosum severed. And the reason that that was done uh, surgically was to stop the spread of epilepsy or epileptic seizures from one hemisphere to another, which could cause them, of course, great damage. So the corpus callosum was severed in certain patients and Mike Kazanica was able to study those patients to see how their brains differed from neurotypical individuals. So some of the split brain studies that Mike Kazanica did were visual studies. So we have a left eye and a right eye, but it's not that if I close my right eye, it's not that everything goes to my right hemisphere. Each eye actually has a left visual field and a right visual field. Okay. So the split brain studies that were done, they asked people to stare at a spot on the screen. And we're going to actually have a little activity in our next slide to do this. So you stare at a dot at the center of the screen, and then they flash an image either off to the, you can't see me, off to the left, or they flash an image like off to the right. And it's supposed to, for a split brain patient, it'll only go to that opposite hemisphere. Okay, so let's take a look at this, see if this works. I haven't done this be my first time live. Okay, so I want you to position yourself about 18 inches. Um, uh, you know, I think that's like 40 centimeters or something <laughs> from the screen, okay? And I want you to stare at a, the dot that I'm gonna present, which you see here, it's the blue dot on the right side. I want you to stare at that dot with both, both eyes, okay? And an image is gonna be briefly flashed. So you go ahead and like stare at that dot. Okay, ready? Here, here we go. Okay, so hopefully you saw that image. It was an X. It was briefly flashed to the left side. So that was going to your left visual field, both eyes. It went to from your left visual field to your right hemisphere. So that was the first answer. The image is flashed from your left visual field, gets sent to your right hemisphere. Now your Broca's area is where? Remember that speech production. And hopefully you recall if it's speech, it's language, it's in your left hemisphere, and you need that left hemisphere to speak about what you saw. So if a person is a split brain patient, they had their corpus callosum severed, and they did the exact same exercise that you just did, that image was going to go to their right hemisphere. How are they going to communicate with you about what they saw? Think about that. It's in their right hemisphere. Can they speak about it? No. Can they use their right hand to write about it? No, because it's in their right hemisphere and your right hand's controlled by your left hemisphere. The best they could probably do is use their left hand either to point to a picture of an X or to draw out the picture of the X because the left hand's controlled by the right hemisphere. So kind of interesting to note, this is how Mike Kazaniga was doing his studies. Okay, we're gonna move on to the limbic system. The limbic system handles motivation, emotion, and memory. Now we're not talking about the motivation, uh, to do your homework. Okay, we're going to talk about more like motivation to survive, to eat, to drink, to sleep. Okay, these are the three structures in the limbic system that we're going to be talking about. There's our corpus callosum, that C there. But we're going to start talking first about the hypothalamus. And I have it, you can see it right here in this blue area. Okay, so this is our motivation center, but it's the motivation to restore our body to homeostasis. So it contains a couple of big structures. One's called the suprachiasmatic nuclei, which controls our circadian cycles. Those are those cycles that we go through every 24 hours, sleep, body temperature. It controls our hunger cycles, and it has two uh, different areas. One's called the lateral hypothalamus. It has the word eight, so it regulates your hunger. And then you have your ventromedial, which regulates satiety, like when you're full. And it also gives directions to that endocrine system that we're not going to talk too much about today, but it sends information to the pituitary gland, the master gland of your endocrine system. So the limbic system is um, an old part of the brain. So if you think about it, it's a part of the brain you would definitely, uh, before we developed that big thick cortex uh, with all that planning and emotional regulation, we really had just our limbic system and our brainstem. So this hypothalamus just allowed us to survive, right? If you're hungry, you eat, you're uh, tired, you sleep, um, basic things like that, okay? So this is our hypothalamus. We're gonna move on to the amygdala part of the limbic system. And then in the amygdala, it's more of our emotional center, uh, especially those like recognizing emotions like fear and anger, and it would help you to survive. 
you'd have to be able to uh, recognize if somebody was friend or foe. Should I hook up with them and make sure that uh, we uh, band together and we go hunt and gather together or do I get away from them because they're dangerous? It's also known for our strong emotional responses and those flashbulb memories, or I should say memories, I should say flashbulb memories, those memories that have highly high emotional content. Then we have our hippocampus, which is memory. And it's really necessary for the encoding of new long-term explicit memories. And we know that through a case study that you may have read about, the HM or Henry Molaison case study, he had his hippocampus removed to stop seizures. Again, we always have issues with seizures. If they were starting in the hippocampus and you removed it, you could stop the seizures. That worked great for HM, except he could never form a new long-term memory. We also think that the hippocampus is, uh, during REM sleep, helps to distribute all the memories that we make throughout the day, which makes sense because the babies spend an awful lot of time in REM sleep and they're making a lot of memories. Okay. So we're going to move on to the thalamus. And the thalamus relay, it's very important. So it's getting its own slide here. But it relays uh, incoming sensory signals. So as something comes in through the peripheral nervous system, those, those uh, afferent neurons, they terminate in the thalamus. And the thalamus will say, oh, it's something visual. I'll send it to the occipital lobe. Oh, it's something auditory. I'll send it to the temporal lobe. Okay. So it sends out all that information to the correct lobes and cortices of the brain, except for one thing, smell. Smell does not get processed through the thalamus. It has its own olfactory bulb, so no smell, okay? The olfactory bulb processes smell, not the thalamus. We're moving down in the brain here. We have our cerebellum and our cerebellum is our little brain. It's in the back underneath, tucked underneath that occipital lobe. We know it's their um, very important role in voluntary movement and balance. And again, remember, these are old parts of our brain before we had a thick cerebral cortex. So you'd have to be able to move. We also believe it stores implicit memories. So those explicit memories are things we can talk about. Implicit memories are things we kind of know that we don't realize that we know. That includes classically conditioned responses like um, being sick when you, for me, being sick when I see wild rice because I got sick one time after I ate wild rice. Or uh, you, maybe you were bitten by a dog, so you feel scared when you see a dog. Okay, that's an implicit memory. And we believe it's stored there in that cerebellum. Now, the cerebellum may initiate voluntary movement, but it works closely with the basal ganglia, which is located closer to the limbic system, um, but it's also involved with motor movement. And actually one helps to, uh, to move your body, but the other one helps to keep out unwanted movements. So they work together to make nice fluid movements. But the basal ganglia, we believe, also stores implicit memories, not the classically conditioned ones like the cerebellum, but the ones like procedural, like knowing how to ride a bike or playing a musical instrument. Okay, as we move down to the brainstem here, we have three particular parts we're going to go over, the medulla, the reticular formation, and the pons. The medulla is the furthest one down in the brainstem, and it's responsible for vital life functions, and those are things like your heartbeat and respiration. It's very close to the uh, spinal cord, which is why we're always very concerned when there's a spi spinal cord injury that's high up on the spinal cord, because if it happens to sever the medulla, you can imagine if a bone fragment gets in there, and you can't, and it, that's what's responsible for your vital life functions, those will go away. Okay? So that's why they always stabilize somebody's neck when they're in an accident. A reticular formation is responsible for arousal. When I say arousal, I mean awareness, consciousness. Okay? It also serves as a sensory filter. So it just takes information coming into our brain and it says, okay, this isn't new. I, I've heard this humming noise in the background. I don't have to keep sending that information to the brain. So it is a little bit of a sensory filter. And then we have our pons, which regulates our sleep and arousal along with the reticular formation, but it also regulates other functions like our posture and our eye blinking and our swallowing. Uh, so you can imagine it's an autonomic, part of that autonomic function. So like I said, damage to the medulla could cause a disruption in breathing, but damage to the pons or reticular formation could actually reduce your ability to be aroused. In other words, you might end up in a coma. Okay, so just a little recap here on parts of the brain. We have the four lobes of our brain that specialize in certain functions. Uh, we have two hemispheres and they're connected by the corpus callosum. 
our limbic system regulates our motivation, our emotion, and our memories. And it's about maintaining homeostasis when we talk about motivation in the hypothalamus. When you're hungry, you eat. Thirsty, you drink. Tired, you sleep. That brings your body back to homeostasis. You can imagine the hypothalamus plays a very important role in the autonomic nervous system. The brainstem, it regulates very vital life functions like the breathing and swallowing and bladder control, all the things you would need to live, kind of think of it as that zombie brain. And then again, we have left and right hemispheres and while they specialize in certain functions in a neurotypical brain, we don't realize that. Okay, so a couple of tips before we start off. I did talk about that olfactory bulb, which processes incoming smell sensations because it doesn't go through the thalamus. And I like to think of olfactory as like, if you went into an olfactory, it would smell really bad, olfactory. Left hemisphere has got a lot of L's, left logic. And we talked about parts of the hypothalamus, one that uh, when stimulated makes you want to eat. It's the lateral hypothalamus that has the word eight in it. The ventromedial is your satiety center. Okay, but the lateral is the one when stimulated would make you hungry. So we're going to practice with a couple of multiple choice questions here. We have damage to Alicia's brain after a car accident left her unable to detect emotion attached to facial expression. So when you hear emotion, look at the answer choices. You might want to pause, but if you come back, the answer is the amygdala. Okay, so uh, understanding or detecting uh, facial emotions is the right hemisphere, but our amygdala first has to be present in order to process that emotion. Damage to the Broca's area, again, discovered by Paul Broca when he uh, dissected the brains of patients uh, that had aphasia. This is most likely to impact which one of these? Pause. And the Broca's area is about producing coherent speech. And finally, we had Myra. She had her corpus callosum severed, in this case, to prevent the spread of seizures. In this case, she were saying if they pictured, she had a picture of an owl and it was projected into her left visual field. So your left visual field, where's it gonna go? Remember, pause and take a second to write down and think what the answer might be. Again, if it's in her left visual field, it's going to her right hemisphere. If it's in her right hemisphere, which controls your left side of the body, you could draw a picture of the owl with your left hand. So this was just like the exercise we did. Okay, we're gonna move on to the brain messages or look at the messengers of the nervous system. And we're gonna also look at psychoactive drugs, um, specifically focusing on neurons, neurotransmitters, psychoactive drugs, and the action potential, which is the movement of messages through the brain. So we talked about sensory and motor neurons already, but we also briefly mentioned those inner neurons in the question that we did, the practice question. Those are in the spinal cord and in the brain, and they handle swift reflexes, but a lot of our cognitive functions. So let's take a look quickly at the anatomy of a motor neuron. We have a motor neuron that's pictured here to the right, and we have our dendrites, and the dendrites are those bushy branches, extensions that, that actually uh, capture incoming signals. Uh, neural signals and sends them towards the soma, which has it's a cell body, it has a nucleus, other structures. That information in the soma and the cell body, the action potential gets carried, that impulse gets carried down the axon. And in a motor neuron, the axon is covered with a fatty layer called the myelin sheath. Now the myelin sheath serves two purposes. It helps to insulate, to protect the neuron, the axon of the neuron, but it also, because it's insulating it, just like an electrical wire that's insulated by uh, plastic on the outside, it warms it up and it makes it go faster. So those neural transmissions can move quickly. And then we have our axon terminals. And in the axon terminals, this is where those neurotransmitters, the chemical messengers of our nervous system are stored and then released into the synapse. So this is the anatomy of a motor neuron. Uh, not every neuron has a myelin sheath, but the motor neuron does. Okay, and that is the direction of the neural transmission from the dendrites to the nucleus, to the axon, to the axon terminal. So sometimes though we do see diseases of the central nervous system that are called demyelinating diseases. And of course now you hopefully know that that means that the myelin is coming off or has been, is being eroded or removed. And so multiple sclerosis is an example of them where the immune system actually attacks that myelin. So it makes it hard to, to do anything that the central nervous system might do like thinking and, and moving your vision, everything. 
Alzheimer's is also a disruption of the myelin of particular neurons that produce acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter. So that will impact your memory and your cognitive function. So we, in a normal neuron, you can see very you know, fast neural transmission, but where you see damaged myelin, like you would see in these two diseases, much slower neural transmission. Okay, so neuron communication. Remember, neurons transmit nerve impulses. So the neuron that's sending the message is called the presynaptic neuron, and the neuron receiving the message is called the postsynaptic. Of course, what's between those two neurons, hopefully you know, is the synapse, right? Pre and post synapse. So here's the transmitting neuron, and there's the synapse, we blew it up for you, and there's the receiving neuron. So I don't wanna to spend too much time on action potentials if you haven't learned it, but really what you need to know is an action potential is um, when an excitatory neurotransmitter opens some sodium gates on the, those branchy extensions of the neuron, those dendrites, and it allows the charge of the neuron to change and it becomes more positive. And it only does so when it only receives that message and uh, by opening up those sodium gates, but it only sends that message on when the neuron reaches a certain threshold of charge. Okay. And that action potential is a very short-term change in the charge of the membrane or the polarization of the nerve cell. And it sends a basically like a, a message from, from the beginning to the end, and it releases those neurotransmitters into the synapse. And then the neuron resets itself. So this action potential graph you may have seen before, it has to do with the exchange of sodium and potassium and the movement of the charge of the neuron. If you really want to study this some more, I know there are um, topics that you can find on AP Classroom that have videos that go specifically through the action potential process. So remember, action potential is an all or none response. If you reach threshold, the neuron's going to fire. So if you do this, just pull very lightly on a strand of your hair, just until you can feel it, okay? Now pull it a little bit harder, and of course you feel a stronger stimulus. So the only reason you feel a stronger stimulus is not because it's a bigger action potential, but instead what's happening is that you're activating more of those sensory neurons on your scalp. Okay, those afferent neurons. So again, action potentials are all or none. So as I said, when, it, when the action potential reaches the axon terminals, that's where your neurotransmitters are stored. And they're stored in little tiny sacs called vesicles. And when the action potential reaches the end of the terminal, those neurotransmitters get released into the synapse. Okay, so you can see it here. And uh, take a look at the diagram here. We have, there's a neurotransmitter the neurotransmitter gets released into the synapse. When it's there, it can actually bind to the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron, that's the dendritic membrane right here. And then sodium's gonna flow in. And if that neuron reaches threshold, it will fire, right? Triggers an action potential. When the neurotransmitter's done doing its job, it actually goes back up through the reuptake channel, ready to be released in the next action potential. Okay, we have different types of neurotransmitters. There are those that are excitatory. So they, they do exactly what you just saw. They increase the chance that the next neuron in the chain will fire. So an example will be if you're learning something new, uh, glutamate, which is a neurotransmitter is being released and lots of action potential to start having you store new memories. But we also have inhibitory neurotransmitters. They decrease the chance that the next neuron in the chain will fire. And why do we need those? Why would you want to have breaks in your nervous system? Well, you know when you get really nervous about a test, well, you need to like calm down after it's over, right? <laughs> so uh, same thing, if you're sitting down to relax after finishing homework, GABA, which is our body's primary inhibitory neurotransmitter, gets released and allows your body to return to homeostasis, right, to relax. So we're gonna go over some of the different neurotransmitters briefly. We have dopamine, it's involved with detecting senses and motor movement and motivation and pleasure. And if you have too little dopamine, you can sometimes get unwanted movement like we see in Parkinson's patients. But if you have too much dopamine, because it's there for sensory detection, if you have too much, you might start to sense things that aren't there. And those are called hallucinations, like those that we see in any kind of psychosis, including the symptom, positive symptom of schizophrenia. With endorphins, they're all about pleasure and pain reduction. So if you have too few endorphins, too little, you might feel pain or sadness. Okay. If you have too much, well, 
you know, it's too much pleasure might seem like, oh, there is no such thing. Well, it is because you can get very edgy, very quick to activate your fight or flight response. You could become a little bit uh, aggressive even. Okay. Acetylcholine, some people call it acetylcholine. It enables learning and memory. And again, those were the neurotransmitters that were involved when we have too few of them in not being able to remember. So too little is paralysis, dementia, uh, we have Alzheimer's disease. Too much muscle cramps, convulsions, because you have too much acetylcholine, well, too much muscle action, you're going to get those muscle cramps. And of course, we do see that in convul people have convulsions. Glutamate is our body's primary excitatory neurotransmitter, so it helps to enhance. Basically, it's like an enhancement of, of, other, of other neurotransmitters and their actions. Um, if you've ever heard of the, um, it's actually a spice, I guess, monosodium glutamate, MSG, a lot of times people put it into food, into recipes, because it enhances the flavor. It, it like activates more of the flavor of the food. Well, that's what glutamate does in the brain, too. So monosodium glutamate, People who have, for example, um, uh, lots of migraines may not want to have MSG. Now, too little glutamate would put you into a coma, right? Because you need to be activated. Um, but too much glutamate can trigger people who have migraines. It could also trigger seizure acti uh, activity like epilepsy. So I, I have another neurotransmitter that, well, we have glutamate, which is primarily an excitatory neurotransmitter. We have that GABA, that inhibitory neurotransmitter that we need to have when we relax. So too little GABA, well, think about it. It's, a, it's inhibitory. If I don't have enough of relaxation, which is GABA, I'm gonna be overactive. I'm always gonna be anxious or have insomnia or I potentially have seizures, be very nervous all the time. But if I have too much GABA, whew, I'll go right to sleep. Right? excessive sleepiness, slowing of the heart rate. So you can imagine any kind of substance which increases levels of GABA to such a high point could put you into sleep or a coma, or even if it stops your heart muscle, death. So I keep talking about epilepsy and neurotransmitters, and, and sometimes people get confused, like, well, is it too much glutamate or too little GABA? Well, epilepsy is usually, when we talk about it, first of all, it's that burst of lots of neural activity that's going on in the brain. And we believe it's linked to a potential imbalance between our body's primary excitatory neurotransmitter, that would be glutamate, and our body's primary inhibitory neurotransmitter, which is GABA. Okay. So those are what seizures are. And they really just spread throughout the brain um, because of this imbalance. Okay. Serotonin. Serotonin regulates sleep and mood. And we know we have too little serotonin. It can lead to sleep disruptions, mood disruptions. And we associate too little, gap, uh, too little serotonin, excuse me, with depression. So this is a chart with all of the different neurotransmitters on it. If you want to maybe snap a picture of that or come back to it later. But these are all the neurotransmitters, which you should know. You should know what their general function is and what happens when you have too much or too little of them. So what happens when you have a neurotransmitter imbalance? So again, if you have too little serotonin, you're likely suffering from depression. And there are biomedical therapies, and these are drugs that can help to increase the activity of serotonin or increase the amount of serotonin in the system. And all those types of drugs are called agonists. Agonists are drugs that mimic a neurotransmitter or block its reuptake. So you can see again in this chart how you treat a neurotransmitter imbalance with different types of um, biomedical therapies. So Parkinson's, schizophrenia, anxiety, um, ha all have neurotransmitters that are impacted by it that we went through. And there are drugs that can treat those, including, for example, antidepressants, L-DOPA, which is a synthetic version of dopamine, which can be given to Parkinson's patients. For schizophrenia, we want to reduce levels of uh, dopamine. So we actually give you an antagonist, which is something that will block a neurotransmitter. And if you have a lot of anxiety, well, maybe you just have like, you know, too little GABA. So these benzodiazepines and barbiturates can act as GABA agonists. So there's a lot on these charts that you have here, and it's really impossible in these sessions to go through all of it, but I wanted to put it into one place for you to go back to and refer. These are all psychoactive substances here. <laughs> 
So I keep saying agonists and antagonists. So agonists um, basically work right in two places, but an agonist is a substance that mimics the neurotransmitter or blocks its reuptake. So it could actually mimic a neurotransmitter right here at the receptor sites and bind to those receptor sites, or it could block the reuptake channel. So it like keeps the neurotransmitters here in the synapse for a little bit longer. And an example of that is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which actually treats depression. So it, it, it stops serotonin from getting reuptake, re reuptake. okay? So it blocks it right here. Um, so there are these reuptake inhibitors, which we use to as agonists to keep or increase the availability of a neurotransmitter that you might have a deficit of. So, here I have an example of, um, again, SSRIs at the reuptake, but L-DOPA, which I said that treats Parkinson's, works right here on these receptor sites, and it pretends to be dopamine. Antagonists are a little different because they're blocking the action of a neurotransmitter. So if you have too much, okay, for example, if you have the positive symptom of schizophrenia called hallucinations, you have too much dopamine, and they're going to work here, right, on the receptor site, and they, they go in to that receptor site, and then it's like putting a key in a lock, you can't turn it, okay, some keys you put in, you're like, wait, it looks like it should fit, but it can't turn the lock, that's an antagonist, it's like a key that doesn't work, but it blocks then dopamine, for example, in this case, from moving on and causing those hallucinations. Okay. So if we put the pieces together, we have those neurotransmitters that are manufactured in neurons that includes all the ones that we see in our brain. And then you have psychoactive drugs, which can alter the functions of our nervous system. They're agonists or antagonists. The examples for neurotransmitters, serotonin, endorphins, GABA. The examples for psychoactive drugs, neuroleptics, like those that treat uh, schizophrenia, antidepressants, those SSRIs, benzodiazepines, which increase GABA. We also have three classes of psychoactive substances. They're called depressant stimulants and hallucinogens. And those are things that we may see that come either naturally or that we take. Um, and they do also, also alter levels of neurotransmitters. We have depressants. They slow down neural activity. We have stimulants. They increase neural activity. And then we have hallucinogens, which as you can imagine, increase levels of dopamine. Um, and again, if I give you examples, alcohol is a, a agonist. Um, it's a GABA agonist and it's a depressant and it actually serves to decrease activity in the nervous system. Then you have things like nicotine and caffeine, which are stimulants and they increase neural activity. And then you have LSD, THC, which also increase dopamine uh, receptor sites. So they it increases hallucinations. So there's all sorts of things besides what's in your brain that can affect your central nervous system. Okay. So again, what neurotransmitter naturally slows down neural activity, and I hope you remember it is GABA. Okay. So alcohol increases GABA. Benzodiazepines increase GABA. Opioids, which are basically pain, right? For pain, they also increase GABA. So Depressants, uh, are depressants GABA antagonists or agonists? So are depressants, this whole category of drug, are they acting as an agonist or an antagonist? Again, they are mimicking GABA, which makes them a GABA agonist. If we look at depressants like opioids, okay, they naturally relieve pain. What is a natural neurotransmitter, our neurotransmitter that helps us relieve pain? And if you recall, those are endorphins. They naturally relieve pain. So opioids are considered, yep, endorphin agonists. Okay. We also have hallucinogens. Hallucinogens, again, uh, make a, a dopamine more accessible. Um, so hallucinogens, if they're increasing do uh, dopamine, are considered dopamine agonists. Okay, just a quick recap. We have those neurons that transmit information. We have action potentials, which is just a shift in the charge of a neuron. And we have neurotransmitters, the chemical messengers of our nervous system and psychoactive drugs, which can alter our nervous system. So I always like to remember Alzheimer's, A, acetylcholine. Uh, low levels are implicated in Alzheimer's. So it's an inability to, to uh, have muscle action. And then we have antagonists and anti like anti is like a block. So I think of antagonists as blocking.
Let's practice with a couple of questions. Low levels of neurotransmitter dopamine are most closely associated with, let's pause. And the answer is muscle tremors like in Parkinson's. Next one, athletes recovering from a concussion often reported decreased in reaction time. Mm, what would that be due to? And yes, it's damage to the myelin sheath. If it gets damaged during a concussion. And go ahead and pause here and read this one. It's a long one. Okay, with anxiety, you would be prescribed a benzodiazepine, which is a GABA agonist, which would help your body to calm down. Okay, we have a lot more to get through, but not a lot of time. So I'm going to go ahead and quickly move through neurogenesis and plasticity and circadian cycles. So neurogenesis is that birth of new neurons. And we know it really only occurs in the hippocampus and maybe the amygdala. So we thought event that you were born with only all the neurons you were gonna have, but we know that throughout time, we do actually grow new neurons. And although it decreases with age, exercise can promote and stimulate it. With neuroplasticity, it is about making new connections. Our neurons make new connections. And we know that we have lots of plasticity when we're young and we have an excess of neurons. But over time, uh, we lose that, okay? Because our plot, we prune, we have synaptic pruning and we don't have as much plasticity, but we're always able to learn. And because we can learn, we know our brain remains plastic because every time you learn, you're making a new connection. You're demonstrating your plasticity. If you're recovering from a traumatic brain injury and you can recover functions that were damaged when neurons were damaged, that also demonstrates plasticity. As I said, we were never going to have time to do all the endocrine system and the glands and hormones, but again, you can take a picture of this here and also refer to AP Classroom for topics on that. 2.2, daily video one. Okay, our stages of consciousness. Well, we have different stages of consciousness, including brainwave patterns like beta and alpha. Uh, those are brainwaves when we're awake and alert and when we're awake and relaxed. Our sleep stages, when we do fall asleep, we go through four different stages of sleep when we have one that just, which has theta brainwaves. Um, we have another, which is delta brainwaves, which are deep sleep brainwaves. And then we finally have REM sleep, which is really interesting because we're in beta, we're in very active brainwave, but we have sleep paralysis. We can't move our muscles. We know that during those NREM, those non-REM stages of sleep um, that we, um, oops, excuse me. Let me go back to that. Okay, we know in our non-REM stages of sleep uh, that a lot of stuff is occurring, including growth. Okay? But during REM stage, which I wanna focus on, this is when we, we move a lot of the memories that we had through the day into our brain. Uh, we have very vivid memories and maybe that is just us moving them into, into our brain, our memories. If you can't get into beta, because beta is a very active brain wave, if you can't get into beta, you can't get into REM sleep. So imagine if your body's always like anxious, you don't have enough GABA, I'm um, sorry, yeah, you don't have enough GABA, you're not gonna be able to do that. So you need to have very, very active brain waves to be in REM sleep. If you do anything to increase GABA, to increase GABA, then you're going to have a problem with getting into REM sleep. And so people who drink too much alcohol don't get into REM sleep, they can't form as many new memories. It does disrupt memory. We have a different ways that we view the brain. And the easiest one to look at the brain and brainwave patterns is an EEG. It's very non-invasive. They just attach some electrodes to your brain and we can take a look at people and how they go through different sleep stages. So we do use the EEG to monitor sleep activity if you're doing a sleep study, but also if someone is having seizure activity. We also might use a PET scan if we want to look at brain activity, just brain activity. Uh, people inhale like a radioactive isotope and it, it demonstrates like or it shows where glucose is being um, metabolized in the brain. And where it's being metabolized means there's lots of activity. So we can see again, the function of the brain with a PET scan. Again, lots of tools of discovery, which we won't have time to get through, but um, here they are here. And I made sure that you could see which of those you can um, see the structure of the brain, like an MRI and a CAT scan, and which are really only dedicated to function, like a PET scan and EEG. But there is one, the, you can see here, the fMRI, the functional MRI, which can show both structure and function. Very useful, but also expensive. So again, to recap, we do grow new neurons, but only in specific parts of our brain. 
Our brain is plastic. It has a lifelong capacity to change. We have circadian cycles, our sleep and wake cycle, which are identified by different brainwave patterns. And the brain is studied using a variety of different methods. So how do you remember all those methods? Well, again, some of my tips here, EEG has two E's in it, like sleep. So we use it for sleep studies. And although we didn't really spend any time on the endocrine system, you have that pituitary gland. Have you ever heard of a pit master? That's like a barbecuing. Well, they're the master, it's the master gland of that endocrine system. So we're gonna go quickly through these multiple choice questions if you would read through them, and then you can pause and we'll go over them. REM sleep is paradoxical because the brainstem is blocking messages to the skeletal muscles, but you have very, very active brainwave patterns through beta. Our endocrine system is not like our nervous system. It actually communicates not through neurotransmitters, but through hormones released by glands. And if you looked at our chart, you can see that all of the following methods uh, to study the brain can show structure except for that PET scan. It can be a little bit deceiving because it looks like you're looking at a brain structure when you see all those colors, but you're really just looking at activity. Okay, what are we taking away from today? Oof, there's so much we did. So we unpacked a lot of information. Um, all the complex behaviors we have are really coming from our brain, our muscles, our glands, and all the coordination. Uh, we facilitate all that communications facilitated through neurotransmitters stored in neurons. Each hemisphere of our brain has a special function, although they work very well together. While we have neurotransmitters, we also have psychoactive drugs, which can mimic or block those neurotransmitters. And our brain can rewire itself in response to new learning or in response to damage. And when we study the brain, that there's certain technology that can show us uh, structure, function, or both. I am now going to present to you in my last few minutes the practice FRQ for this session. We have Aaron, who is a junior in high school, and he has spent the last nine months practicing driving in preparation for his road test. Each day leading up to the exam, his parents let him drive their SUV, and then he drove to and from school and the store, and once even on a long road trip to his grandparents' house. Now, the day of the exam, the SUV would not start story of my life. So his parents borrowed a neighbor's car so they would not have to change the exam date because you know how hard that is. When the examiner got into the car with Aaron, he asked Aaron to conduct a variety of maneuvers uh, with the car, including a three-point turn, parallel parking between orange cones, and a series of stops and turns. And you're going to explain how the two following terms would hinder Aaron's performance during the road test, the sympathetic nervous system and the temporal lobe. One little clue for you, when you use the sympathetic nervous system, please be specific. Give me a very precise example. The second two terms you're going to use to explain how they would hinder Aaron's success on the road test. I'm sorry, the first two were hinder, the second two are success. Uh, and then you have the hippocampus and the frontal lobe. So confuse those. But read through the FRQ. Please try to answer it before the next session. And then Dr. Swope will go over some sample answers for you. So thank you for today. I know we kind of get rushed always at the end, but there's a lot to go through in this unit. Um, it's an especially important unit. And there's lots of little videos you can find on uh, AP Daily on AP Classroom. So again, thank you. And I will see you again in session four.